Give me that release. <laughs> this is for children only. You know, adding, adding more mass can give you a, a little increase in penetration with that added mass, but it's gonna make your trajectory, you know, drop off. So I think there's a balance there. Ooh, look at me go. Oh yeah, boy. Good morning, day one at Elk Shape Camp. We're at Vortex Edge. This facility is awesome. We've been here before. Campers are starting to show up. There's about 30 of them for this camp, and we've tricked them. Hopefully, you know, they're showing up here. I want to learn how to kill elk or whatever. My goal is by the end of the weekend, we expose all their weaknesses, maybe humble them a little bit and show them how much work that there's still left to be done, but ultimately help them find a route to, to leverage elk hunting to like make their life better better husband, better father, better employee or employer, uh, better version of themselves, and, and hopefully get them better at archery, elk hunting as well. So uh, Joel's here, Iron Will Bill from Iron Will Outfitters, uh, Bynum for the fiscal fitness, Jake behind the lens, got a couple of volunteers that helped me out that are awesome, uh, and then the team at Vortex. So it's gonna be an awesome day. We'll bring you guys along. We're gonna dial it up this weekend, big time. You're gonna come out of this weekend, I think we're gonna blow, we're gonna knock your socks off. Thoughts are not thinking, okay? Thoughts are not thinking. Most of you right now are shooting with thoughts in your head, but you're not actually thinking your way through a shot. So today is about learning the mental game of archery and also the mental game of life. I'm gonna give you an equation today so you can plug in just about any problem in your life and be able to kick out a solution. So that's what we're doing today. We're using shooting today to practice the mental game, to practice your concentration, your decision making, all those things. I'm gonna probably tell you some things that are gonna be pretty offensive, <laughs> right? It all has purpose, okay? Like, I might even be trying to piss you off just to get your determination up. Okie dokie, you good with that? Sure. Now, you seem like a pretty calm dude. What was your name again? Justin. Justin. So, you own an archery shop, Justin. Yeah, I'm so not calm. So, you're constantly doing demos for people, yes? Mm -hmm. So walk me through your shot. And I don't want to know your feet and your grip and all that stuff. I want to know from the instant you hit full draw, then what? So you get to full draw, then what? That's what I'm asking. Get the pin on the target, full send. Full send. So get the pin on target, full send. That's your plan. Yeah. Okay, let's see it happen. <laughs> that was full send at its best. <laughs> okay, so... What did I say to begin the introduction? Thoughts aren't thinking. What were your thoughts on that shot? I wasn't doing anything. This pressure is all these people freaking me out. Okay, so your thoughts were about everybody else. Yeah. You weren't thinking about your shot. No. You see what I'm saying? Thoughts are not thinking. Thoughts are what you hear. Thinking is what you say. Two completely different things, right? Thoughts are the voices you hear in your head, like, oh my God, everybody's watching me. Yeah. Self-talk is usually negative. Self-instruction is positive, okay? You would never instruct yourself to do it improperly, right? Right. But you didn't do any instruction at all because you shot that shot with just thoughts alone. Buy this directly from John Dudley? Of course not. <laughs> Got it set pretty hard, that's cool. How do you make this thing go off? My thumb. So you just... No, I mean, how do you... I know how you Thank want you. me to... Thank you very much <laughs> for the instruction. Got to lighten it up. Like, what do you... How do you make it go off? Do you put your thumb around it and stretch? Do you just press with your thumb? What do you do? 95% of the time, I just press with my thumb. Okay. Like, do after you... listening to Dan and watching some of your videos, I can make it surprise, but... You can? I can, but I'm not as accurate. Oh, gave up on it. Was that right? Is that's that right. your right? That's my right. Okay. Is it your right? So you started into it. Yep. You're having thoughts. And then what happens? Like what, what made you actually work the trigger on that? Just where it felt right, I guess. 
so it felt right, and did you see that your pin was in the middle at that point? Yeah, it was floating around the middle. Okay, because you started into a good movement, and then you gave up on it. At the very last millisecond, you gave up on it. And okay. if you give up on it, even the littlest bit, you're going to learn what open and closed loop control systems are and what happens when you give up. That opens the floodgates for all other movements. Yep. So, ah. Oh. You gave up on it, man. That's why I'm holding on to his finger, right? I'm feeling for the impulse. He started into it, and then at the very last second, just like this gentleman here, but you gave it a little bit extra. Give me that release. <laughs> this is for children only. <laughs> why do I say that, right? So attention act, why do you shoot this release? Okay, so you pull through, have you ever shot any other type of release? Oh, you got another one with you. Oh, you're going to step up here with a silverback? Oh, nay, nay. <laughs> so, attention activated release is where people go when they start punching other releases. If you start out with attention activated release, that's cool. It'll start you into a singular minded state, right? But can you get singular minded with the other release? Because this is the least accurate way of shooting a bow, a compound bow, right? It's the easiest to control but the least accurate because it depends on preload. Were you gonna hunt with this? No. So why do you shoot this? Why did you bring this to the high stress event? Well, I guess I, I said no, but I'm not 100% decided. This is fairly new, Okay. maybe <laughs> two months or so. This will be mess. way easier to control. Why is that? Because it has a safety on it. And if you don't pull, your bow's not going off. So it makes decisions for you. We're learning today how to make decisions for ourselves. Was it different than this? Because you, you punched that one like Mike Tyson. Because <laughs> by that sound you made afterwards. Well, I don't know if you were happy with yourself yeah, or not. Just watching the shot. No. Did you hit it? Well, I hit far left. Knocked, that's oh, that's a little gut punch action yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. Next. You see your release? Was that a well shot arrow for you? Can you go 10 times slower? Yeah. Okay. Strike hard, strike fast. <laughs> That's not 10 times slower. <laughs> okay, that wasn't 10 times slower. But you went slower, that was good. But I want like crazy slow. Oh, oh man, you were doing so good. Like what were you doing during that shot? Was that all aiming stuff? Yeah, I was, thought I was on target. You probably were, but you yanked the crap out of the trigger, uh, which made it not go where, it, where you wanted it to. Gotcha, gotcha. Nice. That was a long aim. That was a lot of work. Okay. Yes. I punched it. Good, good, good. Next. Oh, gosh. You knocked it out of the park on that one, buddy. Knocked the trigger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Holy smokes, man. Now, now, All right. go. Oh. <laughs> there you go, buddy. Thanks, guys. Gosh, that was fun. All right. Sound of sparks on that one. <laughs> Punch the shite out of it. How'd that shot feel? Oh. oh, yeah. Oh, you did not pull through that. Oh, pretty good. T -t -t Today, sweetheart. Oh, and then you just go ahead and give up on it. No wonder you got tape on your finger. Because you punch a trigger so damn hard, you got to keep a Band-Aid on there. Oh, oh. oh, there it was. The wind-up cup. Wow. She's yelling at you now, Dan. Now you got April pissed off. Here we go. <laughs> Look at her. Round of applause. Ooh. That was an awesome spark show, my friend. Yeah. 10 by 10 on this. If you don't hit this, you're not hitting the lungs on an elk, right? And there's so much stuff that's on this end of it and on that end of it as far as shoulders, if it was 
If it's facing left, you got shoulder blades, you got, you got liver, guts back here. This is a huge difference on an elk. You know, we got arrows down here, we got arrows in here, we got arrows all over this place because of nerves. You folks have mostly, from what I saw when you're up there, if you punch the trigger the slightest bit, you are literally practicing your own failure when you go practice because you are practicing your shooting. We're going to start to use shooting to practice concentration. you to add a third. Oh, add a third. Okay. And the reason you're going to add the third is because this is now your safety. Okay. So you're going to draw back and aim, get your gap. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Get your gap. Yeah. Get your tension. Okay. So you're going to draw back and aim first. Yeah. Then you're going to tension up yeah. by taking your shoulder blades down and in, right? So you're going to tension up. Yep. Then you take the safety off. So you're gonna take I'll take the safety off. Then. Take the third finger off. Oh, okay. I see. Like you get to aim and tension up right. while the safety's still on. Here I go. Here I go. And you work. There you go. There you go. So finger goes on the trigger. Here I go. Pull. Right? So you're watching this thing. You're watching it and you're seeing it happen. Who's got a thumb button? I'm going to just stretch. There's no thumb movement involved with it. I'm watching it and I'm talking to it. I'm smelling it and tasting it, right? Until it breaks. I'm Joe. I'm right here from Wisconsin. Um, I went to camp back in 2020. Actually, I met Jeremy there too. Um, one of the things I want, want to tell you guys too is don't don't put all your interest into the content stuff here. Put your interest in the guys sitting around you. I met a lot of awesome campers in 2020 and then last year as well, and I still keep in contact with them. We, Jeremy and I text each other every once in a while. I text a group from 2020 as well. I have a group from last year in my squad that we were with, and we, we keep in contact all the time, just keep each other um, responsible for what we need to be doing as elk hunters and as men. So make sure you gather information from guys around you. When you stand up and tell, them, tell, tell your name, Tell each other where you're from. Write it down. If you're within 30 miles of somebody, 50 miles, get a hold of them. Shoot with them in the summer. Do that kind of stuff with other, other like-minded people. So that's one uh, like tip I'm going to give you guys for this weekend. Oh, engineering school in Madison there. I killed my first turkey ever in Ridgeway, which I think is within 10, 20 miles of this place here actually. So I uh, grew up as a whitetail hunter, moved to Colorado in 99 and just went crazy for elk hunting, mountain hunting. So. Um, Started developing my own broadheads and I uh, own a company now, Iron Will, doing broadheads and archery stuff. But uh, yeah, I want to help you guys with your setups. Any questions you have there, any questions you just have about uh, how to be more successful elk hunting after you know being a whitetail hunter to start with. You know, it took me several years to get it figured out and become a, a good elk hunter. But just here to help you guys with whatever questions you have. All right, so guys, Wisconsin knows archery. That's the theme of this video. And Iron Will Bill is from Wisconsin originally, and he knows archery. So. I want to talk a little bit about arrows, weights, a little controversial, but not really. I have a point to all this in this, those ish shots when you're elk hunting, you know, where it's like, hey, ran out to 53-ish or 46-ish or yeah. whatever to where, you know, trajectory should be in your equation when you're trying to build a, a perfect elk arrow. When did you read Ashby Studies? What year? Uh, 2004, right after I had a but I had fell on an elk shoulder blade. I started trying to do research. And yeah, I found his studies back then, read them. Um, next year I was 650 grain arrow. Um, <laughs> yeah, <that laughs> went, went all Ashby, um, you know, I added all that weight. But what I saw is my trajectory was really dropping off. And at the same time, I was trying to increase my effective range because I was getting a lot of shots, opportunities that were over 50 yards, you know, 60 to 70 yards. So I pretty quickly decided that weight wasn't going to work for me. I was just getting too much drop off 
and um, if I didn't have yardage judged perfectly, you know, I could miss the, miss the elk too easily. I think a lot of times elk hunters especially are going to not have yardage dialed to the T. And even if you have a setup where maybe it's three to five fixed pins, but you have a slider, you will risk the biscuit sneaking one more range, sneaking one more dial, only yeah. to come to full draw. And even then the elk takes two steps in a direction and you're going off an ish, not an exact yardage. So yeah. that's my one thing. Like I don't, I've killed more elk with arrows north of 500 than south of 500, seriously. But I keep getting a little bit lighter each year just on, I'm hunting more and more open country elk and trajectory is becoming more and more important to me. And now I'm down into the about 427 to 433. What is your arrow weight for elk for 2023? It's gonna be right around 500 grains. And, and really, if you're only gonna shoot 20 to 30 yards, it doesn't matter very much. Yeah, you go heavy. Go as heavy as you want. Yep. You know, adding, adding more mass can give you a, a little increase in penetration with that added mass, but it's gonna make your trajectory, you know, drop off. So I think there's a balance there. And everybody can check that out for themselves. Just go and shoot heavier arrows at distance, see how much drop you get, and then, you know, dial your sight just a few yards off, or, you know, dial, set it at 50, and then step back to 53 or 54, and shoot and see how much you're gonna miss by. Yeah. If you're off by a few yards yep. judging. You can decide for yourself if you like that trajectory or not. Right. Okay. And then lastly, there's, I've heard all the arrow guys and it's kind of a hot topic. And I really don't feel like we've said anything controversial, just observations from the field. But uh, with your studies with lab radar, cameras that do 10,000 frames a second, fluid modeling, um, you've, you've geeked out, man. Like, does, the, does it matter? Does sound matter when it comes to the veins, the way the arrow, heavier arrows are quieter, all that stuff? How much does sound affect, and this is elk shape camp, so elk hunting. Well, how much does it affect, you know, how much will the animal react to sound, you know? Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna get into that necessarily, um, but sound is it kind of a difficult thing to just look at something and, and say, oh, this is gonna be loud or not loud. Right. I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there, like, Stiffer is quieter. That's, we found that that's not always the case. There seems to be kind of an optimal stiffness. If it's too weak, you can get some vibration and a buzz to it. Um, but if it's very stiff, we actually see that can in increase sound. I think it's because it increases pressure potentially. So, you know, more to come on that. But I think, um, it, you know, in general, probably uh, a slower arrow is probably going to be quieter than a faster arrow. You know, a heavier, slower setup is probably a little quieter. I wouldn't necessarily, you know, I think having good arrow flight, good, tra good trajectory are kind of more important in my book than, than trying to go after sound, especially if, if you don't really know something you're doing is going to be better or worse. So flight, tune, then trajectory, then sound. What's your order of operations? Yeah, I mean, good arrow flight, number one, hitting, hitting what you're aiming at is definitely, yep. you know, number one, most important. You know, after that, you can start trying to minimize the force to penetrate. You know, have a good cut on contact broadhead. It's durable. It's going to cut through, get you max penetration. You know, on elk, I think that's, you know, flights first. And then what can I do to get max penetration? Well, a broadhead is a big factor. If you can cut that force to penetrate in half, you can get twice as far through. And then you can start looking at arrow mass. Um, increasing mass will help. Um, so increase it as high as you can for the trajectory that you want, mm -hmm. is what I say. So... You know, go out and just test. Keep adding arrow mass to see what your trajectory is like. And then you can often decide from there. Oh yeah, I like, you know, this 450 or 500. Um, I think starting with 150 to 200, or say 150 to 175 grains up front, get a properly spined arrow for your bow poundage, draw length, arrow length with that much weight up front and see what that total arrow weight's gonna be. Mm -hmm. Pick something in that say 450 to 500 range Go out and give it a try. Yeah. Um, I think it'll be a good setup for you. Last but not least, guys. So Bill uh, helps out with camps whenever he camps. So we don't always have you at every camp. But since the last camp, you've launched your own arrows. This is your chance. Man, we do have a podcast together. Check that out. I'll drop a link in the video description. But here's your chance. Tell us about your new arrows. Yeah, thanks. So we, um, I sponsored a study at the University of Colorado to really study arrow veins for improved broadhead flight. So we tested six of the top veins in the industry, along with some other um, prototype veins. 
and we, we, we found that this hybrid hunter vein actually had the best you know, overall results when we looked at broadhead accuracy and stability, spin up, drag, sound, uh, wind drift. If we okay. factored in all those things, we found that this performed the best. And really, um, accuracy and stability were a lot of that. Having a higher profile vein um, does a good job when you have a fixed bladed broadhead in the front. If anything's not perfect, if you're out of tune a little bit, yeah. or if you torque a little bit. Oh, not me. <laughs> yeah. Then it's going to stabilize it well and right. you know, hit the bullseye there. Yep. Um, and you know, we worked with, with Easton to machine fletch these at a three degree helical. And then we add our reinforced hit system on the front, our hit insert impact collars. And we're selling these as full length shafts for people that want to finish them themselves. Or we also made a machine so that we're effectively um, have a machinist in a machining center, very accurately cutting, squaring both ends, you know, perfectly really to try and take out any, um, any human error in, um, in the aero builds too. On Easton's, I've ran Axis, FMJs, et cetera. When you buy a dozen from Easton, they come with like this little wheel thing, like this, yeah. and then you'll see guys like, I know I've done it. You're like, Shh, or you're, Shh. is that, yeah. how would that compare to your machine? Yeah, ask a machinist if he'd use that to, to square apart. And <laughs> he's, he's saying no, you know. Okay. So, I mean, if you, if you could hold your arrow perfectly perpendicular to the, that and rotate it, you could, you know, square it um, a little bit. But no, this would be in a machining center where you have a precision machine tool. You know, this is chucked up. It's being rotated. We have a machine tool cutting it and then a facing tool squaring it precisely to, you know, um, the tolerance is going to be less than a thousandth of an inch with this. Wow. Type, so. Okay. And that little, a typical cut you might get and then rotate on that, you're uh, five thousandths or more, maybe ten thousandths wow. off. Yeah. And so that's going to drive all the force through one side. You know, it's not going to be consistent arrow to arrow with all the force through the knock and into the arrow. So it can make a little differences in how each arrow flexes and, and impacts down yeah. range. Now, if you just make that machine that I could buy, have in my garage, and make it affordable. We could. It's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. This is Iron Wheel Bill. Check him out. Um, video description on his arrows and where you can learn more about them. We do run his components and his broadheads. The speed route. <laughs> Time saver. Yeah, I'm testing uh, how well different veins stabilize a broadhead. So I actually have a bow slightly out of tune. I know it comes tail left out of the bow. And so the, the veins have to correct it, pull it back on. So it's a good test with this with our S125 broadhead. So it just shows you how well the veins can quickly stabilize it and put it right back on track. So I'll look and see how, how close these hit to center versus uh, field points. With different vein setups, this is a blazer, um, as well as a few other prototypes I have in there. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, let's go, whoa! Oh, I'm gonna wreck on this bad boy. <laughs> I punched the trigger, I, I shoot on purpose. That felt pretty good. What I'd like to see is a vein that stabilizes at least as well as everything we have, because these really stabilize really well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's also quieter, mm. less drag. Huh? 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 Ooh. Look at me go. Whee! I'm gonna shoot two field points, two broadheads. See where they go. So that's the new prototype and how well that stabilizes. I'm trying to do your method, like anchor, get the anchor done, get the aim done. Okay, pull through, but it's more of a control. Like, okay, I'm controlled, I'm steady, but I'm still. But it's fast. It's still open loop. It quick, yeah. Because once you send the motor program, you can't stop it. I want you to be able to stop it. You still gave up on it at the very end. Did I? You'd think. If you're testing, you can't have pre-ignition movements in your shot, bro. Your finger just pull. No, you move your finger. I'm gonna cut that freaking thing out like that, <laughs> God. That speed, stay in that, keep going. Keep going, come on, you gotta make it move. There you go, keep going, keep going. Doesn't matter where the arrow goes, keep going. There you go, that's a surprise break. It's gotta go, it's got that, that roller's gotta come out of that. 
Yeah. So that's where you're you're feeling all that. You know, like you're having to actually put some serious tension on that thing. Better. And back pressure. There you Ooh, go. That was a surprise. So finger pressure and back pressure as a linked yeah. motor program. Uh, yeah. So we just got everybody introduced to Joel. He's teaching him his shot IQ curriculum. They're in the classroom, um, working through those things. We're gonna take a break. Come over to Vortex HQ give you guys a quick behind the scenes look because Wisconsin knows archery. We're gonna look at some rangefinder options for you bow hunters out there and just kind of meet the team over at Vortex and uh, continue on this video. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Come on guys. Are you working? Call it a lunch break. You're a stater? Yeah. yeah. So if I was going, let's just say I was going 120 in a 55. Uh-huh. Are you gonna send me to jail or just write me a big ticket? Just write you a big ticket. Like it's how big a ticket? Uh, $300, $400 or something. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Not that I was ever doing that, but. Yep, and it's Saturday and Sunday, every day. Can't work weekends, can't work holidays. Graham, Wisconsin knows archery. We do. You got, we just went HHA, we're at Matthews. Uh, there's awesome pro shops. There's so many bow hunters here. Vortex knows archery. So, what are some of the best options and price points? for Vortex rangefinders for us archers. And let's talk it with an angle of like maybe going out west or doing yeah. tack where there's like angle compensation, things like that. Yep, absolutely. So kind of with all of our optics lines, our rangefinders have price points for everybody. Sure. Right? So if you want something entry level or if you want the highest quality and ranging capabilities that you can, we've got it. So everything from our Crossfire HD 1400 all the way up to the one that we just launched, our Rager HD 4000 GB, which has ballistics built into it. Okay. Not necessarily an archery play, right? Sure. But it's got a lot of cool features there, especially for the Western hunters that are breaking out the rifles. But to your point, all of the, our range finders are going to have angle compensation, so you don't have to worry about so anything. So all of them there. do? All of them will have it. Yep. Okay. So you're covered. Um, really just depends on application and kind of what people are looking to spend. Okay. Usually what I tell folks when they're looking for range finders is go with the best optical system and laser that's in your budget, right? Because archery, you know, what's the farthest shot that you're gonna take? In yeah, 50 situation? and under. Right, so any of our range finders are gonna range that distance. Yeah. So a lot of archers will pick up, you know, an entry level range finder and be like, this goes out to 1400 yards, good for me, right? Sure. And they wouldn't be wrong. And that's really light, by the way, the crossfire. Yeah, Like super light. There's nothing to it. Yep, even though, right, let's say look at the Razor HD 4000, right? Do you need that ranging capabilities? No, but with that stronger laser, you get other benefits, right? Because more than likely, you're not always hunting on a 75 degree sunny day. So if you've got fog, rain, snow, any inclement weather, that stronger laser is gonna punch through and give you a better reading. So even if you don't need the distance, there are benefits to going up to those higher options. Yeah, I would, I would push people to at least start at the, the 3000 Viper. Actually, I have both and I run this one yep. over it. I like the display a little bit better, it's got a pretty strong laser as well. Um, it's got good glass in it. So like, I think a rangefinder should be able to get you a little closer. You know what I mean? So maybe you have an elk and you're having a standoff and you can kind of like slip this up, get not only get your range, but maybe get a quick peek at him, see yep. what his body language is and it pulls it in. What's the magnification on this? What's the glass? So this one will have them all listed right on the back here. So this is a seven by 25. Seven so by seven, 25. Most of them are gonna be in that six to seven range. Okay depending on the model. And then we also do have range finding binoculars as well. Yeah, the Furies. The Fury HDs, yep. Yeah, and, and we've, we've messed with those. I still like range finders better. And guys, the, the, the warranty here, if anything were to go wrong, anything like house fires. Yep. What else? Uh, I mean, anything that happens to them, I mean, even the electronics are covered for life. So yeah. if anything happens to it, you just give us a call, we'll send it in and fix it or get you a brand new one. And to me, that's pretty much cool. And, it's an investment and to know that if something were to go haywire, you're gonna have, like that Vortex has your back. We it's got your v back, yep. It's a VIP warranty that is transferable too. So maybe you don't end up getting, you find a deal on Marketplace or one of your buddies, that warranty follows the product, which is really, I mean, that's pretty respectable, right? So that's awesome, man. Anything else you wanna show us? Yeah, I mean, that's about it, but yeah, we appreciate you guys stopping by and obviously the showroom's open. So if anybody wants to stop by, check out optics, check out the apparel. I know you were eyeing up uh, a couple yeah. things there. So yeah. yeah, we'll go over there and do a little shopping spree. Let's go maybe. do a sh little bit of shopping. Yeah. And you guys watching, maybe I'll pick something out for you and we'll pick a winner. So let's go oh. check out. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Yep. Everything's good? Yeah, how are you guys? Awesome. Life? Yeah, this camp is fun. Tell me about your products, what you do for Vortex. No, absolutely, man. So I'm the apparel product development manager. Uh, I came on board about five years ago to really kind of get the apparel line going. 
Um, was super cool, great opportunity, couldn't pass it up. Yeah. Um, so really it was to kind of take the line just from t-shirts and caps yeah. to elevate it. To really kind of take it into that lifestyle kind of clothing line. Um, yeah. you know, we're already supporting our customers and it's all about the customer in the field. So how do we kind of expand into that when they're not in the field all the time? Sure. And apparel was the way to do that. And it was to really give them something that they could use in the field in a way that they found helpful, beneficial, but also wear it every day. Yeah, it's kind of cool when you have a crossover. I always talk about Vortex wears like, hey man, you can wear this to work around the house. You can wear it when you're scouting and you can wear it if you're taking the misses out on a date or whatever. Yeah. Now I've, I've actually antelope hunted in some of these materials before. So these are performance materials, right? Yeah, correct. Talk me through these. Yep, absolutely. So this is our Sunslayer line, uh, which is probably our biggest line as far as like growth, uh, which has been super exciting, but it checks all the boxes of UPF 50. So UPF 50 protection, antimicrobial, so it's gonna stop that bacterial growth before it starts, starts help with the odor and stuff like that, uh, and wicking. So again, it's gonna keep you dry, keep the sun off you, keep you from stinking, which you check all through those boxes, you're ready for date night. Yeah. You know, it's one of those. That's pretty cool. Um, but again, it's one of those ways to give you something that, like you said, you can wear antelope hunting, you can wear in the field. Yeah. But if you're bumming around the house in the garage on a Saturday afternoon, it's comfy, yeah. it's cool, you know, and it's just, it checks all those boxes for you. So this is our new rain jacket. This cloud is our shaker. cloud shaker rain yeah. jacket. And it is fully seam sealed. This is probably the most technical thing we've done so far. Oh, right on. Um, so $129.99 price point, but it's two and a half layer stretch. So it's uh, rated 10K, 15K. So rather than getting like all the crazy like waterproof breathability stuff, we really bumped up the breathability on this. Yeah. Because when we're looking at rain jackets in this price point, it's like we're in a garbage bag. You know, you build up heat really fast if yeah. you're hiking, if you're moving, doing anything like that. So we built in pit zips so you can dump heat quick, made it extremely breathable with that 15K so your body just like lets off all that moisture passes through the jacket, you don't hold on to it. So you throw it on early in the morning as an outer layer piece. If it's cool out, you throw this on, it's gonna keep you warmer. It looks pretty packable too. It packs into its own pocket. Oh so snap, Here Actually, we go. I feel like you kind of set me up for that one. So if you take the left pocket. Look at Vortex. So, yeah. there's your pocket. Good to go. Good for your boat, for your pack, wherever. So this is actually a tick repellent sock okay. that we developed, came out last year. It has permethrin built into the yarns. So basically what this does is if a tick or anything, uh, it's good against like ticks, chiggers, mosquitoes, anything like that. If they step foot on the fabric, it creates like a hot foot effect. They don't like it. So their first instinct is to get off. So it doesn't create a halo effect around you necessarily. They have to make contact with it. But if you've got boots on and they're climbing up the boot and they hit that sock, they're going the other direction. That's awesome. Yeah. So super excited about stuff like that. It's actually good up to 70 washes. Oh my God. Right. So there's a lot of life in that sock. I'm taking those home. <laughs> Ooh, should I size up? This, this one's spoken for fellers. So Jeff, what color are you? Nope. Jake, what color are you? Uh, I'll take that white one. White one? What size? Medium. That's not true, but fine. Okay. And Jeff. And down here. Jake, you wanted a large? Uh, yeah. Size up. Okay. I think that's good. That's all they can afford. But guys, we got it hooked up. Vortex Wear. Uh, the discount code is Oakshade for 20% off. This is an awesome company. If you want to support them, uh, let's move on. We'll go back to the camp and have lunch.